the zoom out. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, thank you to Ethan and uh, Benjamin for getting me all set up here. Uh, so, and please do have someone interrupt me if uh, I start veering off course or I can't be heard or the usual zoomy kind of problems here. Uh, so, my name is Chris Gamble. I am the developer relations lead at Goliath. Uh, Goliath is a IoT SaaS platform that works really, really well with Zephyr because we love Zephyr. We use Zephyr. I use Zephyr just about every day in my job. I am a hardware designer, so I Zephyr is kind of my first real-time operating system and ecosystem in the same way. And uh, yeah, I'm a big fan. Uh, and so I'm going to be talking about taking your stuff to production and kind of all the things that go along with that. Uh, and then the, really the, the things around the RTOS and the ecosystem that are going to make you build better products. Today, along the way, we're going to be using our little friend here. This is Echo. This is our new mascot uh, for Goliath. And you see there's five stages. I'll go into each one indiv individually um, as we go through the presentation. But uh, there are multiple stages going through production, right? That's a, that's a, a, a tru truism, I think. Uh, just that you're not going to get it right on the first time, and you're going to have to make incremental changes as you move your hardware along. And so we're going to talk about the different pieces of uh, Zephyr that can make your product better. Um, the thing to note is that just because you're using Zephyr in a product doesn't make doesn't make the underlying challenges that different, right? Using Zephyr in your product doesn't make it a different product development process. From my in my opinion, I think a lot of the same problems exist. But I think a lot of one of the reasons I like Zephyr so much is the tools in the toolbox, and that's what we're going to be talking about here today. That's going to be on the bench, but also in the factory uh, and and also in the field, right? You have to think about the entire life cycle of your product, not just from not just on the bench, not just in the factory, but like the thing in your final user's hands as well, and how you're going to interact with that product. Zephyr is often referred to with IoT or Internet of Things, and I think it fits really, really well uh, in that use case, which is why I'm using it every day. A lot of the things you're going to be seeing here today are. Uh, different ideas. And I'm, I'm basically, you know, from my opinion, I'm adding, adding these ideas to the different stages of a product, but they can really be used at any time. Um, so uh, if you're like, no, that one, you know, don't use I squared C shell only with dev boards, you should use it in production too. It's like, yeah, fine. Okay, fine. Uh, so all of these things are usable at any point in the process. Think of this as just a lot of different tools in your toolbox. Uh, but this is a huge area of study. Um, and for the beginners out there, this is going to be kind of introducing to some of the new things for the experienced people out there. You might be like, I already knew about this, but hopefully there's some stuff in here that you hadn't thought about. Uh, one thing to note in general around production is you just don't know what you don't know. And uh, that's one of the things that continues to, to excite me and surprise me and make me cry about electronics hardware design is that you just you're going to run into new products and problems that you've never run into before. And so then it's just about how you respond to them, how you use the tools at your disposal to solve these problems. So uh, because this is such a big area of study, I'm going to be having a ton of QR codes. I don't know if people do or don't like QR codes. You can also download these slides uh, at any point uh, or these, I think maybe download, maybe just access them, hopefully not edit them. Uh, <laughs> but that's in the lower right there. And you'll see QR codes throughout a lot of the stuff that Goliath does. We do a lot of content around Zephyr. And so there's going to be references back to that content for more depth, right? And not just to Goliath content, but also um, you know, Zephyr Docs, which is fantastic, and Nordic Docs, and just a lot of the resources that I use on a daily basis. Okay, let's talk about the early prototyping on DevBoards section. Also, my favorite uh, animation of Echo, uh, soldering with the tongue out, very, very cute, very key. Uh, so the whole idea here is that you're validating your overall idea, right? You want to make sure that you're uh, that your thing, the thing that you're eventually building, you're probably building it for some kind of business use case. Maybe not, you know, maybe you're using it for hobby use cases or whatever, but the end of, you want to make sure that you're actually building something that people want that you want. And uh, yes, uh, the hardware itself at the beginning at this stage doesn't matter a ton, right? You, you should be able to switch between different ideas because you're validating the idea. But when you do switch, this is where Zephyr plays great, right? Being able to switch between different chipsets, different sensors, different peripherals, all the things that you might need in your end design, you're going to be validating that in this first thing. Uh, and even though there is a huge learning curve, uh, you know, and there are a lot of training resources, we do free training. Uh, I think it's so useful to get started with learning Zephyr at the beginning so that in your prototyping stages, you're basically, you know, once you get over that learning curve, you really start to see a lot of uh, benefits later on, you, building out your own products, but also 
doing incremental stuff. So like the next product, the next product, you, once you're in the ecosystem and the flow and you start to understand things more, you really start to, to level up and, and go faster. Okay, so first things first, let's talk about board files, right? So we're, I'm almost always starting from a dev board. I'm starting from the top down. A lot of the times when people are asking me, you know, free RTOS versus Zephyr, right? I always talk about top down versus bottom up, right? In free RTOS, you're almost always starting from just the scheduler and bolting stuff on and adding it up to the top, right? Uh, in Zephyr, I am always starting with dev boards where I everything is known and tested and working well on a certain dev board, and then I strip stuff away uh, and or only use the stuff that I need about it. And this usually comes down to board files, creating .conf files for doing kconfig symbols, doing the overlay files to change out your pins or to add in new capabilities uh, in the device tree. Uh, these are really, really important things. One thing I will point out is the porting guide uh, for Zephyr is probably not what you're going to do right out of the gate if you're you know, starting a new project with a dev board. But using that methodology and understanding what you need to do under the hood is really, really useful there. Um, and just seeing all the different boards that are already available, it's a, a great kind of palette. Uh, if you think about it, like all the paint colors of Zephyr and all the silicon that you get to start with, really, really useful there. Uh, this is, uh, again, I mentioned at the beginning, like kind of starting with beginners, people who are like in the Linux world, they're like, oh yeah, menu config. Of course I know menu config. Me as a hardware engineer, I was like, uh, what now? Uh, and so this was like a huge one for me where it's like, yes, you're building up all this stuff with the device tree. You're starting to, uh, you know, dig down through the, the structure that you're setting up in these files. But I didn't know, it took me a while to figure out that yes, you can go into menu config and, and see it all one place and try and change it and modify it. And then you can click on one thing and nothing changes and nothing changes because there's dependencies that are baked into there too. So it's super useful to be able to um, see all the things that are in maybe your dev board that you're starting with, maybe your sensors that you're adding on there, understanding why you're trying to add the sensor and it's not working because of your device tree set up wrong, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so menu config is really, really key for this kind of stage when you're in the board, you're in the dev board phase. Uh, and uh, one thing that also is very, very useful is understanding that once you hit save and menu config, there's actually a new dot config file and you can do some diffs and start to extract K config symbols that you then put into your future stuff. That's really, really useful there. Uh, this is something I use all the time. So sensor and I squared C shells. So I start every product as a hardware engineer using Zephyr now, I almost always start from uh, if I'm if I have an application space where I know I need a temperature pressure humidity sensor I am almost always reaching for the BME 280 because it's just the it's in tree it's ready to go I understand how to use it and it's you know it's not the cheapest sensor but it's like it just works so well so again in this dev board phase where I'm not cost sensitive and all these other things it's super easy to integrate this sort of thing and then the layer on top of that is because it's in tree because it's, there's a sensor driver for it it's so easy to then go and go in the go into the shell be on a, a console and and start to actually just extract readings, right? So like sensor get the device device name at, at address in this case, and then you just start getting temperature out or accelerometer data out. And it, it's so, so useful from a prototyping perspective. And when I, especially when I compare that to past times when I would go and stand up, you know, maybe I'll go grab an Arduino and start to write code and pull in libraries and all this other stuff. It's all just there. And that's where I really find a lot of this stuff to be super useful uh, from, a, from a prototyping and building up a, a product perspective. Uh, when there isn't a, a driver, you know, I've maybe I've chosen, I've, I want to try out a new driver that's, or try out a new sensor that's not in tree, and I don't want to go write the whole sensor myself. Uh, I dive down the layer of abstraction, right? I go and I'm, I'm okay reading a data sheet and peeking and poking registers. And you could just do that directly with I squared C. You can even do that in the shell as well, if you want to. And you know, it's, uh, you could maybe script it together a little bit, but really just the ability to, to activate at these different layers of the abstraction, really, really useful for me. And something that I, I highly recommend because it's just going to let you validate that idea in this early, early stage here. Uh, okay. So I know that was kind of brief for the overall, uh, uh, dev board thing, but, uh, there are many tools that also could uh, apply there. Uh, so let's talk about when you start getting into your first pilot. Uh, so I, I usually think about this like 10 units. This is, I mean, again, we're going off my experience here, which is maybe may or may not be useful for you, but uh, you know, 10 units, uh, basically enough to program a bunch of them, get some differential behavior between them, make sure your assembly all went well, make sure when you blow up a board or two, you have a couple more, you can hand them off to coworkers. So that's why I like 10 units. Um, and this is really one when you want to start validating the, you know, the actual chipsets that you want and the sensors that you want, all the peripherals that you have on there. And it's kind of just pulling it all together into one place. Um, big shout out to KiCad for uh, making it easy to make PCBs. Uh, and so um, uh, 
it doesn't have to look like the final form factor, but it it uh, it might. Uh, and the main thing is you should be pulling stuff forward in your process as much as possible. I, I should have mentioned this earlier on, but one of the things when I when I said you don't know what you don't know, one of the things that'll be most useful in uh, in a lot of these a lot of taking things to production is pulling pulling the hard stuff forward. So things like testing and provisioning and for programming, all the things that you're going to do in any kind of uh, design, uh, you want to you want to be able to pull that forward as far as possible so that when you have problems with it, you can design it into your next rev of hardware. Um, let's, uh, here we go. Uh, so uh, as you start to package this thing up and, and you start to uh, uh, pull it all together, you might want to, uh, you might want to, well, first off, you might just run out of URs. That's, that's one that I've run into before where I'm just like, yeah, yeah, okay. I used all the pins or I used all the UR peripherals and it's just, it's just all, it's all gone. So, uh, uh, you know, alternate, Logging uh, can also be, be useful. So RTT is a segger based thing that you can just kind of go and turn on. If you look at that prj.conf in the lower right there, it's super easy to way to turn it on. But uh, you know, when you start to get more constrained because you have these realistic hardware things like running out of pins or peripherals, or whatever, uh, you could start to output that to, to a different place uh, like your programming header, right? Other things you could do is you could start to push it to other backends. You don't just have to do it to RTT. You could do it to, I think you can also do it to RAM. Uh, you could do it to cloud backends like Goliath. Goliath has a, a tie-in where you, we compress and send send the logs back over the cloud. So the same thing you would see on your URL normally, you see it on the cloud. Very, very useful. And we're not the only ones who do that sort of thing. You do need to have a network connection for these sort of things. So having like a network uh, logging capability. But uh, if you're starting from a dev board, like I talked about, usually you already kind of have that ready to go. So super useful there. Uh, debugging tool. So this is something I'm also using, you know, as I'm trying to wring out all of the early bugs and hardware, right? I'm, I'm using things like, uh, you know, again, two Segger things in a row does not mean I only use Segger stuff, but it, I have written multiple posts about this sort of thing before. Uh, so that's where a lot of this came from. And uh, I, I just think it's really important to get as much, you know, even though you're encasing this, you might be encasing this thing in plastic. So, you know, this is a device that, oh, look at that. I have a debugger here. I'm not sure how much my video is available on screen, but, you know, starting to put stuff into cases, you want to make sure that you have as much visibility under the hood now that you are kind of closing things off. Dev boards are great because they break out all the pins, uh, but then you start to enclose things in plastic, shrink things down. You're not going to have as much uh, capabilities to to probe on different areas. And so uh, you want to have other ways to do that sort of thing. So Ozone is great because uh, it's thread aware. They're not the only one, but you know, obviously you could start from GDB and you know, all the baked in stuff into VS Code, but uh, thread awareness is another one that's really, really useful, I think. And that's why I started playing around with this because again, I was new to RTOSs. I was writing writing threads. I wanted to understand where I was when I halted a program. Uh, and then uh, that's that was uh, a very, very useful thing for me. Another one is uh, system view, which is basically a way to view where you're spending all your time in your different threads as well. So that's also very, very useful. Um, and yeah, that's the way that you would do this in some of the prj.com for you could have put it in your board files in your board file.com as well. Uh, MCU boot is another thing like again as, as you're pulling stuff forward in your production process, you want to make sure that you're thinking about updates, however you do it from day one right you want to make sure that you. Uh, uh, you're really taking care of all of your updateability, right so. You can update it again when it's already enclosed in plastic. You have all this stuff set to go. Maybe you're already picking your memory parts, and so you're already thinking about how you're going to be dealing with a more constrained memory environment in order because you want to save money on your end uh, device. So uh, thinking about that now is very very useful. Um, MCU boot is you know my go-to when I'm using Zephyr again because I'm usually starting from projects that are based on MCU boot. Um, you can also start signing keys and having having more security baked in. We'll talk about security a little bit later. But then also having, uh, you know, again, I talked about blowing stuff up and being able to recover from that, but being able to recover from hard memory errors and being able to get back to the, the bootloader and uh, load new images in. Very, very important for from my perspective. Keep losing my mouth, sorry. All right, so um, definitely not all inclusive there. That was the first 10 devices. Uh, now let's get into... Uh, Let's talk about now you're actually in a production, right? So maybe you're at a con contract manufacturer shortened to CM. Uh, you're going to be maybe up to 100 units. Uh, but now you need to be thinking about things like test infrastructure, right? You're, you're probably going to have a programming stand, a test stand at your manufacturer. You should be pushing that forward as much as possible. You want to be thinking about things like test points on your boards and how that might be interfering with, you know, if you're really size constrained, you need to make sure that you have enough room for test points. You have enough capabilities in there. Maybe you have additional chipsets that 
give you more visibility into the final product. And at, in, in a contrary kind of motion that you're not giving so much access that uh, it's very easy to, you know, extract your firmware later and you're not able to, um, you know, you're, someone's not able to take off your product without you wanting them to. Uh, and then finally, costing down is another one, right? As you go to production, you must always have downward cost pressures and you need to start thinking about that as well as the form factor. So it's a lot of kind of conflicting things here, but in, and really DFM or design for manufacturing and moving stuff towards manufacturing is kind of its own process and its own art form, but uh, some of the tools here that are gonna kind of help you here. So one thing that uh, I've recently been doing, I actually just went from the, 100, the 10 to 100 and uh, yeah, I have a Rev A and a Rev B. And one thing that I didn't know about and one of my teammates wrote about was the managing of board revisions. So just having default board revisions in Zephyr, being able to target them with an at symbol, uh, you know, having a default version in this case, which is B, but then also being able to backport and look back at the Rev A board and then have that support there. So then you see kind of on the lower right here, having all of these, you know, so the Elixir is the board here, we have some common stuff, but then we started having hardware changes so that when I, when I want to go and target Rev A or Rev B, uh, of which I have both, I didn't blow up all of Rev A. Uh, and so now I want to be able to have this variation and I want to, I want to have something very specifically called out, right? If I, if I've changed the sensor and I want to, and I try and uh, access that sensor on the Rev A board and it doesn't exist, I want to know about that sort of thing. I want to have that in my build process as well. Uh, so that's really, really useful there. Provisioning is another really important one as you start thinking about your device going through production, being on a test stand, being on a programming stand, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, so, uh, and, and then they wake up and they want to get onto a network, right? So in a lot of the use cases that I'm thinking about, you know, so the device that I'm often working with is called the Elixir. It's an NRF9160. It is a, a cellular device that talks back over the cloud. And so I want to give it a certificate. So when it wakes up, it talks to Goliath, the back end that my company runs and and uh, usually, you know, when I'm in prototyping on in the Rev A, I was doing pre-shared keys, but that's not the most, uh, you know, those can be extracted, they can be utilized by a bad actor, that sort of thing. I, I don't want to give that away. I don't want to have that in the device. Instead, I could have a certificate in there and I want to, uh, I want them when they first connect, they have the chain of trust. And then basically, um, as more and more devices come online, it's just, there's no programming step to program in credentials then. It's just basically the device wakes up, the secure certificate stored securely in memory. And then uh, when it wakes up, it presents that, that certificate, the public uh, key to the uh, the cloud and the cloud hands back and say, hey, yes, here's your, here are your credentials. You're, you're allowed in for, through the front door. In terms of loading the certificates, uh, here's one example of the way you're doing. You could do that. This is the link monitor from from uh, NRF Connect for SD, uh, for desktop rather. Uh, but you could also have a, you could have a specific firmware image that's just there for loading in the certificate. That's uh, kind of the first thing you load on in the production line, and then later once you have certificates on board in the in the secured memory, then you basically load on your production firmware as well. So thinking about some of those those different capabilities and those different uh, possibilities. Uh, are really important, I think. Testing infrastructure, right? So this is one where you you very easily could argue you should be doing this at the dev board stage or before you even start the dev board stage if you're uh, really, really into that sort of thing. And uh, I agree. Uh, and one thing that you can really lean on is a lot of the, the great resources uh, from the Zephyr project itself. The fact that all of Zephyr is being tested all the time at every revision and every every commit that's, that's being pushed there. Uh, and uh, I just think that when you start to, to have uh, sufficient complexity in your your product, you really start to, you know, even if you wanted, even if you were super into the idea of testing it all manually yourself, it just starts to become onerous. And and each new release, you know, you you're not always running the test the same way. So uh, using things like PyTest, Twister, Device Sim, all these things, Device Sim is a simulator, um, and all these things basically can start to uh, kind of harden your design, your 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 Zephyr design toward towards uh, future changes, right? So future changes are going to happen. You should be planning from that from the beginning. Another thing you could do, and uh, my coworker Mike was on Benjamin's first uh, tech talk, which everybody should subscribe to if you're not already subscribed. Uh, a lot of great talks there. But Mike was talking about uh, hardware in the loop testing. So this is now kind of taking a lot of these ideas and then kind of putting them into the real, real world, having GitHub actions that basically uh, when you do a commit, it does the build on the back end. It pushes the image out to actual hardware, programs it, and then in uh, Mike's latest top left talk or blog post up there, he also did some 
testing using PyTest as well, which is really, really useful. So highly recommend all of these resources here. Uh, grab your camera, grab your uh, QR codes uh, and go dig in because, uh, well, as a hardware engineer, I'm usually not the one doing it, but I benefit from all of the Zephyr folks that are doing this sort of thing and my coworkers also who are doing that sort of thing. Remote firmware update, I already mentioned you should be thinking about firmware updates uh, on the device, and that might be something as simple as having a cutout in the side of your, your box that you're doing. Uh, first, uh, funny story, the first revision of this board that I you may or may not be able to see, uh, it was just a dev board that was kind of soldered into an interstitial board. And uh, yeah, the programming header was on the bottom of the plastic, and you had to cut out the plastic if you wanted to do that. So that's not... That's not the best way to do things. Uh, so it could be as simple as putting a cutout in your plastic so you can actually access programming headers or enabling MCU boot so you can do uh, bootloading uh, over USB or something like that. Uh, or you could do something like remote, uh, you know, so basically taking MCU boot a little bit further using a remote, uh, remote firmware update or over the air updates. And so this could be something like you, you might be doing it yourself, having the device go out and fetch an image. You might be using a service like Goliath that has an OTA service that's kind of out there doing a, uh, a subscription to an o OTA, um, you know, based on its tag and its revision and things like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're basically pulling down this image, you're loading it into your other slot of memory. In this case, uh, you see in the lower right here, we see that there's um, actually a thing, again, on the shell, you can type MCU boot and you can see the different um, different versions you might have in memory and how their, uh, you know, their hashes, if they're okay and that sort of thing. And then which one's actually the active, the active one there. So um, just thinking again, just think about firmware updates as soon as possible. Uh, yes, probably in the dev board stage, but if not in the dev board stage, when you're at a hundred, right? If you're at a hundred units, even just plugging in a hundred cables, right? That's just you're plugging a cable in a hundred times. It's super, super difficult to do that sort of thing. So thinking about that as soon as possible. Uh, and then, you know, this is really gonna benefit you deep into the life of your product as well. All right, so now we're at scaling production. You've done your first run, you've done a hundred units, you're, uh, you're feeling good about that sort of thing, but now you really start to run into a lot of the different issues that are associated with production, right? And, and volume production at that. Maybe you're moving to a third revision of your board. Uh, maybe you're good with the second revision. Uh, maybe you've thrown it all away and you started over, but I would say that's probably a different different problem at that point. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, but at this point, you're, you're probably solidly into the costing down side of things. Um, you might also need to be start playing around with um, uh, your hardware going to different versions of the world. So you might have to deal with uh, different regulations. You might have, uh, for example, like I mentioned, the NRF 9160, uh, some places have LTEM, which the modem covers, and some places have NB-IoT, uh, and you might have to target for different regions of the world as well, uh, based on that sort of thing. Then in that case, it's usually just a K-config switch, but you know, then you have to figure out how you're going to uh, switch that sort of thing. And then finally, at this stage, you really, you know, you really need to be like very precise on your automation and your uh, your testing infrastructure at the factory. So we're going to be talking about optimization, but then also, you know, how do you make more of these things, right? So it's not just about optimizing cost; it's also now about other things like optimizing battery, right? And so uh, you're really in production. Again, this is another. You could argue you're doing this way early in the process, but at this point, you really, you know, at the scale we're talking about here, you need to be really, really good at making sure all your stuff is working here. So uh, pin control is a system that basically allows you to have different modes for pins. One good example here, this is from uh, one of the Zephyr Doc sites, but basically you might have a uh, different drive strength on a, you know, a push pull kind of pin where you, in a low power mode, you just turn that off so it's not leaking current. Same kind of thing for pull ups or pull downs in a I squared C context as shown here. So you might have those sort of things different or uh, yeah, so you can have just uh, different modes based on which mode you're in. But more broadly, the power management subsystem is another great way to start to reduce power. And this is where a lot of the silicon vendors that are tapping into Zephyr, they basically m match up a lot of their uh, hardware abstraction layers to the uh, Zephyr API so that when, you know, me as a Zephyr user, I call something like, like the sleep mode, uh, it then goes and does a bevy of things on the silicon itself. And that's specific to that silicon, right? So it turns off certain types of clocks or turns off different sections of the silicon uh, without me having to think about it. Maybe I can dig down in the abstraction and do it myself, but most of the time I don't want to. Uh, and I just want to take advantage of the sleep modes. Uh, this is something where 
there are lots of kind of dragons uh, in the corners. And so I would definitely do a lot of testing at this uh, anytime you're implementing the power management subsystem, but uh, but mostly just uh, you know thinking about it and thinking about how you can save your battery at this point if it is a battery powered device. Uh, and another one is the uh, just kind of powering, thinking about powering down entire subsystems as well. This is one that we've been doing uh, at Goliath recently where uh, the board that I've been showing here it has uh, it has a whole secondary section. You know, there's a secondary uh, Wi-Fi modem. There's a bunch of sensors, and I just kind of shut it all down when I don't need it, right? And and uh, that is a great way to just make it really easy to uh, have a load switch and turn off the power to everything. Make sure I actually have secondary switches for the I squared C, so there's no like phantom power in those as well. And uh, yeah, it's it's uh, you need to make sure that you're turning them on when you want to at boot, and then you're able to turn them on and off from your application code as well. Okay, other optimizations here. Security is probably my weakest thing, uh, and there are a lot of great resources here. I think the lower left, yeah, is actually a talk from the first uh, ZDS by Kevin Townsend, uh, and the right one is actually some uh, uh, Nordic resources about TFM. So I am not a super, uh, <laughs> uh, super security person here, but there are a lot of samples that are built into Zephyr as well that you should uh, be digging into at this point. And, um, you know, some simple things too, right? So like the default key in the bootloader, you probably shouldn't be using that uh, at any time, you know, even at the thousand stage, right? You should not be thinking about, you should have your own keys uh, already in your bootloader uh, for your device so that for a couple of reasons, one, just for general security and making sure that some rando off the street can't send you a, a uh, firmware image, but then also, uh, you know, you might have even just different uh, SKUs within your corporation you might have different products. And if you mistakenly send the wrong firmware update to the wrong device, uh, having a secondary key, having a key in the bootloader will also just alert you that, hey, this doesn't work on here because this is the wrong product. Uh, so another kind of just uh, easy thing there. And then finally, uh, you know, letting using PKI or public key infrastructure, basically making sure that other people can't get at your keys and your certificates, but also the fact that you can't lose them, right? Because basically losing them is, is uh, once they're gone, they're gone uh, sort of thing. And uh, that's very detrimental to business. Uh, in terms of data, I'm often thinking about this because I'm often doing cellular stuff and, uh, you know, data has a battery cost like we already talked about, but then also an actual real cost here as well uh, in terms of when you're paying a MVNO or an MNO. Uh, and so you might wanna be cutting down on your data as well, especially as you start to scale your fleet, right? You're, you're, if, you're, if your data costs 50 cents per device per day or something like that, and you, can, and you have a thousand devices in the field, you know, every incremental cent basically starts to, starts to give you an extra 10 bucks. So, uh, and, then, and then that scales with the number of devices you actually have in the field. Uh, so Zephyr actually has some built-in protobuf stuff. Uh, so it's uh, nano PB, I believe it's called. Did I get that right? Yeah, it's somewhere in there. Um, and But there's other serialization you can implement like Seabor. Seabor is another serialization protocol that you can use. Uh, and that just kind of uh, knocks down your overhead instead of running JSON. Um, and uh, that really, really helps there. Uh, and then much like you might have on the... Uh, the, the UART, you can you know, send all of your debug messages, all the logging levels that you have within Zephyr. You might be sending those to the cloud as well, but then you also might want to turn those down. And so what the code on the right here is showing is if you wanted to go and so this is actually a remote procedure call that uh, my coworker Mike wrote. And basically it just steps through and changes the log level on every module within uh, Zephyr. And, uh, and we can trigger that remotely. So I can call set log level, uh, four and that will send all it'll basically say warnings errors info and debug all of those come to the cloud right and i might want to do that for a particular device when it's having an issue and i want to see all of its debug messaging but then for most of the fleet if i have a thousand devices out there and i want to save data i don't want to see that i just want to see errors i want to see all the errors and maybe i want to see the warning so i set it to set log level at two it sends this it it's, it runs through all of the different uh uh modules within the zephyr application again this is after boot right you have to have them all compiled in so your your log levels are in there right there so it will take extra program memory but then you want to be able to uh trigger those on or off and that's what you're seeing here uh, so it's setting that sort of thing and that's using a remote procedure call 
And then finally, uh, optimize your test stands as well. So this is, um, you know, as you are building out your, if you're building a thousand devices or more at your CM, right, you probably want to be optimizing that process as well. And I mentioned already that, that basically des design for manufacturing or being a test engineer, these are, these are entire fields that are, you know, that are past the development phase when you're into the production phase that, uh, that this talk will not do justice to. Um, but you, you can, uh, you want to make sure first off that you're covering all of the tests that you need, you know, basically the bare minimum to cover all of the functionality that you have on board, right? You, you might not need to send uh, a Bluetooth packet to a secondary device to test that Bluetooth works, but you probably want to make sure that your, uh, your device was at least assembled correctly and that you are able to output the power level that you expected, right? You can definitely test those sort of things. And then, you know, you rely on the, the firmware piece later to actually handle all the stack. Uh, so at, at the very least, you want to have an image that can go, you know, for, sorry, a firmware image that's on the device in a test environment uh, where you're just validating the output power, right? Maybe just plugging in an external, and instead of an antenna, you shortcut the antenna, you are outputting some power level into a load and you're able to test that. Um, and, uh, and that might be enough for a production line, but then later uh, you take that, that production line firmware image off the device, which maybe is running through a bunch of tests for LEDs and outputs and RF power that you wouldn't be using in your act in the actual field. Uh, so you're doing this on the production line, you have your own image for the production line. And then the last stage of that is actually to load your final image onto the device. And that's actually what ships. And that's when you do provisioning as well. All right, we made it to step five. Uh, and this is, you know, this is kind of the ongoing one. This is the this is Echo pointing off to the future. Um, and, uh, that's because it's, this is one thing that just never really stops, right? Is, you know, if you are maintaining devices, they're out there until they uh, take themselves offline, you take them offline, you decommission them, that sort of thing. Um, you know, as your, as your capacity continues to come online, you might have 10,000 plus devices in a fleet, but this is where you really have to lean into automation just because, whereas, you know, when I have the 10 devices on my desk and I'm, in the Goliath console, or I'm using a UART output on the screen, I can do that for 10 devices. It's maybe frustrating, but it's possible. 10,000 devices, it's just not possible. Even if you have a bunch of engineers or uh, technicians doing that sort of thing, it's just, it you really starts to become uh, un unrealistic. Um, and so you need to just be thinking about your, this is where device management really becomes critical, I think, and then also automation and kind of alerting based on this sort of thing. So this is really where I start to lean into the, you know, the IoT portion of Zephyr IoT, uh, because I think that once you can start connecting these things and they can report back to the cloud, you can start to have more software based automation instead of, uh, you know, just an individual device uh, doing its own thing. So one thing, uh, in this case, the setting subsystem uh, on Zephyr is fantastic and really uh, allows you to to push a lot of different things down to a device, right? So I could basically, so some of the settings that I often have are like LED colors on a tricolor LED, right? So maybe I want to boot up with a different color. That's trivial. Uh, but things like uh, calibration constants and the amount of time between cleaning cycles on like an air quality monitor, uh, all of these things are you can push them down to the device. They're stored in non volatile memory. This is using, that's using the Zephyr subsystem. And then I'm often also layering Goliath sub, uh, settings service on top of that basically, so that it's sending these settings down to the device and then they're getting stored locally and it's synchronizing and telling you which are or are not uh, uh, actually synchronized at the time. Um, another thing I already mentioned, I already mentioned uh, remote procedure call, but I'm often using threads and work queues. Um, this is probably my crowning achievement as a firmware engineer, a burgeoning firmware engineer, but I uh, put a uh, PWM version of Mario onto a uh, piezo element, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, and I did that all in a thread. And uh, so that was kind of my, my earliest introduction to threads, um, implementing PWM and, and running through these different ideas here. But then I also trigger them remotely, right? So basically being able to send this command down to a device, send it additional uh, control elements like which song to play because it's not just Mario on there. A little, uh, it's pretty pretty cool. Uh, and uh, and then kicking that off and, and monitoring it through the time, right? So uh, basically being able to control elements of your hardware, uh, being able to trigger that remotely using a, a cloud element as well, and uh, and then kind of the not having to think of it element of 
a thread, right? So once you've kicked off that thread, it's really the scheduler that's doing all this stuff. Uh, and so both for work queues and threads, just kind of the, the hands-off nature of uh, uh, Zephyr processing in that way is very, very useful. Oops. Uh, another thing that's super important at scale like this is uh, tracking volume issues. So, you know, you get 10,000 devices, you really are only going to be dealing with the outliers. Uh, and when you start to get into these, you know, large numbers as well, and 10,000 is just the beginning of large numbers, uh, is uh, you need to, you, you need to have some exception reporting and you need to be able to watch for bad behavior here. So that's uh, something you can do there. I wrote a post a while back about some visualization. You might want to have, you know, a dashboard where you can scan down there, but even that is probably not enough. You want to have some some software side capabilities where it's it's looking for anomalies. Maybe you have some some cloud side machine intelligence. Maybe you just have some log level or sorry, some setting levels, and you start to do some statistical process control. But all of those things are possible once you ship that data off to the cloud. Another thing though is, you know, you need the devices to kind of take care of their own. And uh, one way you can do that is is using uh, watchdogs. This link on the left here is uh, uh, just the, the Zephyr docs are in watch, watchdogs, but software watchdogs, hardware watchdogs, these are all capabilities to go and make sure that if it's the device is not operating within its its limits, that it will reset itself at the very least or, or call for help or have some kind of exception reporting either on the device or on the cloud. And then finally, uh, uh, doing things like core dumps and actually like being able to do, to um, use services like Memfall to actually ship that stuff off to the cloud as well. Um, basically, seeing when things do go wrong and and if you got a core dump, things are probably going pretty wrong. Uh, but understanding how that stuff actually goes uh, and and what's going on there, and especially if it's happening at scale, right? If you got ten thousand units and one percent of those units is is uh, has some particular capability. Uh, problem that you're seeing in the core dump, you can start to actually resolve that and send out uh, firmware updates as well. In terms of extensibility, uh, this is another thing where, again, you start to have these lots and lots of devices in the field, you want to make them even more useful. Um, you can push things out like uh, the file system, right? So you could set up a fat FS or a little FS, and then you could start to push stuff out to these devices and use LLVM to lo uh, have local uh, visualization. Um, I just learned about LLEXT from Ben, Ben's wonderful newsletter, which again, I say subscribe to, uh, but these are linkable extensions as well that basically you start to have some dynamic uh, capabilities as well. Again, at you might have a bunch of devices that are just a base firmware uh, image out in the world, but you might be able to ship down a binary that uh, can be run as an extension and you can have different flavors of hardware at that point. The key point is again, to just call back, you need to have some way to push your data out to your devices. You need to have some way to have some feedback, both pushing out device, uh, updates, in this case, just binaries, uh, both file, you know, maybe JPEGs for your, your screen and uh, loadable extensions for your LLEXTs. Uh, but you need to have some way to do that. And if your device cannot process them already, you want to also have OTAs. So I think I made it to the end. And I think I made it under the under the wire. Uh, yes, so we have five stages, we went through a bunch of stages here. Many of the things I've said have been possible to apply at different stages than I was showing them, like I was mentioning. But the important thing is to be thinking about them up front. Hopefully this talk was useful for just just tickling your brain and be like, oh my gosh, I really should be getting better at OTA or I should have some kind of remote command control or I should be using watchdogs. I, I meant to put in watchdogs, but I didn't put in watchdogs. Um, yeah, so uh, hopefully all these stages are here. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm glad y'all were here today and that I got to present remotely. Uh, I'm sad that I'm not at ZDS slash EOSS in my first year, I'm missing it. But uh, I hope to be back next year. And uh, thanks for thanks for being here. I can't hear it, but I assume there's uproarious applause at Any this point. Any questions for Chris? Yeah, there's one here. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, thanks for the hello. presentation. Uh, I have a question. Um, uh, when you were mentioning about uh, firmware updates over the air or the remote, I'm uh, mm -hmm. recently I got to a problem that I changed the, the partitioning of the Zephyr and that couldn't be done over the air. I just want to see, do you have uh -huh. any recommendation or solution for these kind of problems? So as you said, when you have thousand devices out there, it's not possible to like bring them back and connect it and change the partitioning. So if you have any yeah. solution, I would be happy to listen it. Thanks. Hmm. 
I do not. That's a, that is a tough one. I think if you had, you know, some kind of secondary, well, I'll go just off the hardware that I have. If you had like a secondary modem, it's maybe possible if you had like external firmware programming from there, but that's probably, a, that's again, like something you don't uh, probably have built in. Um, that's a tricky one. Uh, yeah, I guess I just I'm make a plug right. for Discord, mm -hmm. basically like ch check out maybe the MCU boot uh, channel on Discord. There might be solutions with like multiple, like second stage bootloaders and stuff like that. Um, that may be a, mm. a way to get your answer. That's a great, great one, Ben. Or ask Ben. He's another. Nope. Resource. <laughs> <laughs> Not on that one. Uh, yeah, that's a tricky one uh, for, for us both, I guess. Uh, other questions? Yeah. All right. And Chris, FYI, you had, I think we are like about 35 people now. So you had more people joining All right. as yeah. you were speaking. That well, thank you everybody good. for coming. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, I, let, let me check Zoom real quick in case there's a question there too. Um, no, I think yeah, so all the slides through. are in the lower right here. If you wanted to do this stuff after the fact, those are all available. Um, I've already put in a pitch for uh, Ben's newsletter. If you don't <laughs> subscribe to that, you're 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 missing out. Uh, and uh, yeah, Goliath also does a lot of content around Zephyr. We also accept uh, external authors around Zephyr too. So uh, if you're ever interested in writing, we love Zephyr. Have I made that clear? Maybe I've made that clear. Ben, we what love do you, you think? too. All right, thanks. <laughs> Have a great rest of All your right. day. Thanks so much, everybody. Cheers. Okay. Yeah, the QR code is actually sort of cut a bit uh, for us in, in, in the room. Um, yeah, but please make sure to upload okay. your slides on your session. I don't think you have. Um, like yeah, just create a PDF, put it on sked.com uh, for everyone to, and, and uh, yeah, and yes. now if you can make it like really big on screen, maybe go well scan the code too. Mm. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. It's in the corner. You know what? I can just edit it. What am I doing? I'm in charge here. Yeah. yeah. I am the captain now. Yeah. And yeah, but yeah, put them on the website as well. I think that would be useful for this. I will. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's great.